Stone Age tombs were typically shaped like houses, with two large vertical stones and another stone slab laid horizontally across them as a sort of roof. They were also filled with tools and food and personal possessions necessary for the next life. Greek and Roman tombs continued to be furnished with daily effects, but the purpose went beyond providing shelter and began providing an impressive visual memory for the living. The Great Pyramids in Egypt were the most impressive example of this. Tombs were constructed up to the Middle Ages, where churches themselves often served as tombs. By the Renaissance, the practice of building tombs mostly died out in the West and was replaced by the practice of building monuments or memorials or statues along with funerary urns. In cultures such as Mesopotamia, tombs and graves were cut into the ground in the expectation that the soul of the individual would more easily reach the afterlife that they thought existed underground. Graves in the ancient world were usually marked by the stone bearing the person's likeness, such as the funerary masks in Egypt. So whatever kind of tomb was constructed, I mentioned there was the importance of providing a good tomb for the person in order to get their blessings when they were in the afterlife, but the funerary rites were very important and were some of the most elaborate rituals of ancient civilizations. The burial of the dead has been traced back to arguably 50 to 100,000 years, as we can see by a grave of Kafez in Israel, where 15 people were buried in a cave along with their tools and other artifacts. One grave in Wales, one of the oldest graves we found in Wales, is called the Red Lady of Wales, which is thought to be 29,000 years old. Let me just kind of run through the different sorts of ways that people would be buried in some of the main civilizations in the ancient world. I'll mention Mesopotamia and then Egypt. Throughout Mesopotamia, if you weren't royalty and not buried in the royal cemetery in Ur, you were buried below the family home or next to it so that the grave could be maintained. The thought was if a person was not buried properly, they could return as a ghost to haunt the family. These ghosts could be a disembodied spirit causing problems in the home or as a form of possession in which the spirit entered into an individual through the ear and wreaked havoc in one's life or personal health. Cremation wasn't very common throughout Mesopotamia due to the scarcity of wood. And also, Mesopotamians thought that the proper place for the souls of the dead was in the netherworld and not in the realm of the gods. If one were cremated, it was thought that one soul ascended skyward toward the home of the gods, and a human wouldn't be at home there. It was better for one soul to descend into the underworld with other human souls. A few were cremated and the remains were preserved in urns, but the dead body was not embalmed. Instead, professional mourners washed and perfumed it and clad it presentably, painted its cheeks and darkened its eyelids and put rings on its fingers and provided it with a change of linen. This burial process was further developed by the Egyptians. In Egypt, the dead were also buried underground and famously in the pyramids such as those in Giza. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. The pyramids were tombs that were descended from the most primitive burial mounds, and the pharaoh apparently believed that every living body was inhabited by a spirit that need not die with the breath. So the pyramid, in a way, stood as a means of deathlessness. But obviously, most Egyptians couldn't afford a pyramid, so a grave in the earth was the usual final resting place for them. The deceased would be buried with goods and other household items as much as the family could afford to help with their chores in the afterlife. Burial practices in Egypt extended to a family pet as well. Herodotus noted how in an Egyptian home, which had lost a cat, the family would shave their eyebrows and observe a period of mourning on par with the death of a human being and cats were mummified as were dogs and other pets, and rituals were observed at their passing. For both common Egyptians and royalty, sacred spells from the work known as the Egyptian Book of the Dead were recited to direct the soul toward the Hall of Truth and the judgment of the great god Osiris. Osiris would weigh the heart of the deceased against the white feather of Mat, which held truth and harmony, and if one's heart was found lighter than the feather, one was given passage to the field of reeds, the Egyptian paradise, which was a mere image of one's life on earth. If one's heart was found to be heavier than the feather of Mott, it was thrown to the floor where it was eaten by the god Ameti, and the soul of the individual ceased to exist. So the tradition in Egypt of creating funerary mounds first and then pyramids, along with tombs inscribed with their deeds, was to make sure the ruler wouldn't be forgotten by the living 
and continue to exist on Earth even after death. To erase one's memory on Earth was to erase one's immortality. And this Egyptian obsession with death was parodied by later poets, famously in the poem Ozymandias, where a traveler recounts going to Egypt and seeing the inscription on the statue of Ozymandias who proclaims, Behold, I am Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty ones, in despair. And the statue is in complete ruin, and it shows that nothing they tried to do to achieve immortality or permanent earthly greatliness came to pass. So from the modern period, we can see that. But from the ancient world, the Egyptians were very powerful. Their tombs must have seemed otherworldly and probably pretty convincing at what they were trying to do, of stating the immortality of the deeds of the Egyptian pharaohs. The royal pyramids were adorned with paintings depicting the life and accomplishments of the deceased king and filled with all those necessities a spirit would need in the afterlife in the field of reeds. Pharaohs were interred in the area known as the Valley of the Kings, and their tombs were elaborate homes which reflected their status as divine rulers. Now, there are other parts of the world that have similarly ancient tombs, even though they might not be as grandiose. One of them are the Neolithic tombs of Scotland and Ireland. The tombs of Scotland, such as the Grave Passage tomb in Orkney, show a remarkable similarity to those of ancient Greece. They date to 3000 BC, and one tomb, called the Tomb of the Eagles, has the bones of over 300 people. Among the skeletal remains were those of over 700 white-tailed eagles, which gave the tomb its name. There weren't any personal possessions found in these tombs, but their absence might have been due to the ancient looting of graves, instead of their belief of the supernatural at the time. So the Neolithic tombs in Scotland were purposefully designed, as in other cultures, as homes of the dead in the land of the dead. The Tomb of the Eagles, for example, you would have to move aside a great stone and descend down into the chamber, which represented the netherworld. The same construction can be seen in a tomb in Ireland, in Newgrange, which is one of the oldest tombs in the world that predates the Pyramids of Giza that were built between 3300 and 2900 BC. The Newgrange tomb was constructed to emit a single ray of light in the darkness of the inner chamber at winter solstice and it's thought to symbolize the eternal life of the deceased. So those are different tombs in Europe and the Near East and the ancient world, but I want to jump to a structure that's much older that is probably a tomb, but it's also a site of religious worship, and we don't know the people who are buried there, but this site tells us that commemorating the dead could very well have led to the rise of civilization as we understand it, and I'm talking about the structure of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Gobekli Tepe is located six miles from the city of Urfa in southeastern Turkey, near the borders of Syria and Iraq. I've been there, and I cannot emphasize enough how isolated this place is. You're in an isolated part of the country. You're surrounded by farm fields. It just seems like empty, open plains, and you feel like you are dropped in the middle of nowhere. But if you go there, you'll find signs pointing to Gobekli Tepe, and it's one of the most startling archaeological discoveries of our time. There, you'll see massive carved stones about 11,000 years old that were crafted and arranged by prehistoric people who hadn't developed metal tools or even pottery. The structure is older than Stonehenge by about 6,000 years. And the people who built this site, that seems to be some sort of religious site of worship, along with what's thought to be a tomb, was built by people who hadn't even developed agriculture. And the archaeologist who oversees it is Klaus Schmidt, And he thinks this site and sites like these actually kicked off the agricultural revolution. And just think about the time scale here, 11,000 years ago. The time difference between when Gobekli Tepe was built in ancient Sumeria is bigger than the time gap between Sumeria and today. And think about how foreign and alien some of these ancient cultures like Sumeria seem to us now. And when I'm describing these burial rituals in Egypt and Sumeria and how strange they sound, you're decorating cats and doing all these things. We're closer to those civilizations than Sumeria is to Gobekli Tepe. So what it looks like is this. In the excavation pit, there are standing stones or pillars arranged in circles. Beyond, on the hillside, are four other rings of partially excavated pillars. Each ring has a roughly similar layout. In the center, there's two large stone T-shaped pillars that are encircled by slightly smaller stones facing inward. The tallest pillar is 16 feet and they weigh between 7 and 10 tons. Pretty hard for a primitive society to do that. Some of the pillars are blank, 
and others are elaborately carved with foxes and lions and scorpions and vultures. They're twisting and carving on the pillar's broad sides. You also see images of the human form there of large hands. So it's large, boxy-shaped people, and it sort of looks like David Byrne from The Talking Heads when he would wear those gigantic suits. It's kind of hard for me to describe this, so if you just go to Google Images and type in Gobekli Tepe monuments, you'll see pictures of what I'm talking about, and you can get a good visual image. So Klaus Schmidt has talked about his theories of what they signify when he did an interview with the Smithsonian a few years ago. And he described the site as one of the first human-built holy places. Now again, if you go there, Gobekli Tepe is on a hill. It's about a thousand feet above a valley, which is brown and featureless today. But 11,000 years ago when it was built, it was before centuries of farming and settlement. And there would have been herds of gazelle and wild animals, flowing rivers. And that site is close to the Tigris River. So there would have been migrating geese and ducks all around and fruit and nut trees and barley and wheat varieties. So it could have been like a paradise to those people who built it. Gobekli Tepe is at the northern edge of the Fertile Crescent, which has mild climate and arable land from the Persian Gulf to present-day Lebanon and Israel and Jordan and Egypt. So hunter-gatherers from Africa and the Levant would have regularly crossed this site. But there's no evidence that people permanently settled there. So this was a large structure built by people who were hunter-gatherers, which really upends a lot of what we think about what people like that did. There's also thousands of bone fragments from animals there that are complete with cut marks and splintered edges that are signs that the animals from which they came from were butchered and cooked. So that gives us clues on how the people who created Gobekli Tepe lived. That's what makes us think it was a hunter-gatherer site. The abundant remnants of wild game indicate that the people lived there hadn't domesticated animals or farmed yet. But Schmidt thinks that Gobekli Tepe's builders were on the verge of a major change in how they lived, thanks to an environment that held the raw materials for farming. They had wild sheep and wild grains that could be domesticated and people with the potential to do it. Research at other sites in the region, in southeastern Turkey, showed that within a thousand years of Gobekli Tepe's construction, Settlers had managed to corral sheep and cattle and pigs, and at a prehistoric village just 20 miles away, geneticists found evidence of the world's oldest domesticated strains of wheat. Because radioactive carbon dating indicates agriculture developed around 10,500 years ago, or just 500 years after Gobekli Tepe's construction. And when you're dealing with ancient archaeology, 500 years is nothing. So these findings suggest for Schmidt and others a novel theory of civilization. For a long time, historians thought that only after people learned to farm and live in settled communities did they have the resources and organization to build temples and support complicated social structures. But Schmidt thinks it was actually the other way around. The extensive coordinated efforts to build monoliths and sites of worship and tombs laid the groundwork for the development of complex societies. Schmidt thinks that the hugeness of the undertaking of Gobekli Tepe reinforces that view. He says the monuments couldn't have been built by ragged bands of hunter-gatherers. To carve and erect seven-ton stone pillars would have taken hundreds of workers that had to be fed and housed. So this led, from his point of view, the emergence of settled communities in the area around 10,000 years ago. So cultural change came first, and then agriculture came later. That in that area was the place where complex Neolithic societies emerged. Now, Schmidt and other historians say that it's really hard to understand why people gather there to erect these structures and bury stone rings. Because like I said, the time period that separates us from Gobekli Tepe's builders is huge, longer from Sumeria to them than from us to Sumeria. So they looked at the world in a way that would be impossible for you or I to comprehend. This is 6,000 years before the invention of writing. So it's very difficult to understand the symbolism in a prehistoric context. But archaeologists still have their theories, especially when they look at the kinds of animals and things that are carved into the stone. And this is where we get into the site possibly being a tomb. The pillar carvings aren't dominated by typical prey for a hunter like deer or cattle, but by menacing creatures like lions and spiders and snakes and scorpions. So maybe these hunter-gatherers were trying to master their fears by building this complex. Danielle Stordur who's an archaeologist from France, noted the significance of the vulture carvings 
That's because some cultures have long believed that carrion birds transported the flesh of the dead up to the heavens. These were symbols at a burial site or 